Jesus. I'd like to thank you all for coming this morning. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Jeff Fries, and I am the assistant to the pastor here at uh, Grandview Christian Assembly, who is out this week. I believe he'll be back next Sunday, Alicia? No, not, okay. So, uh, uh, and um, this morning... We are going to continue our summer series on outreach, and I've got the message you've all been waiting for this summer, and that is on outreach to strangers, witnessing to strangers, right? You've all been waiting for this one, right? Here, okay. And uh, as I was preparing, I, I was talking to Seth. We, we used to pastor uh, our campus church called Oasis, and every it was either before summer break or before, I think this might have actually been before Christmas break, we'd give a message to the college students and we'd tell them, okay, you're going home, you're going home to your parents, um, don't forget about Jesus. And uh, this one message I gave this one time, I actually, I had a little pocket Bible and I said, don't drop kick Jesus and I kicked my Bible across the room and uh, Seth reminded me that there was one person there, I think, that had a verse that said you're not supposed to kick the Bible, right, Seth? I, I had to apologize. Um, but I, I know how it feels. I know how it feels. You, you work hard, you, you, you follow the Lord, and you get some free time, and you just want to take a break. You just want to clock out for a little bit. Um, that, I think that same time, Seth, at Oasis, um, I had a trip planned to go down to Florida, and I think this is, we just had one kid, so Natalie and Bella were already in Florida. I did the right thing, Seth. I waited until after the planning session to fly out. So we had our planning session for Oasis. I flew out, and I had my book ready to read on the airplane. And I was, I was just, I think I might have even prayed like, Lord, I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to witness. I just, I'd like to just clock out from the Christian life here for a minute. It's a two and a half hour flight down to Tampa. Can I just read my book? I, I need to catch up on my reading. And I remember, like, you know, there's ways you can tell people you don't want to talk to them. So I had the, um, I had the window seat on the plane. And I remember I contorted my body like this. And I had my book. And uh, I was just kind of sitting there like this. And this lady, of course, sits down right in the middle seat. And she, she looks over at me and she says, are you okay? Is everything okay? I was just like, doggone it. I don't want to talk to anybody. I want to read my book. And it's interesting. It started to have a conversation with this lady. Turns out she was Jewish who had had a dynamic con conversion to Jesus. We talked all about that, and then she told me about her husband, whose similar story had had a dynamic conversion to Jesus. We're talking the, the whole flight down there. She even mentioned she was, a, she was a multimillionaire, as it turns out. She said, I've always wanted to help pastors. It's been a dream of mine. And, and uh, um, <laughs> she, uh, she actually, Natalie and I and Bella actually went to her house. She's in Fort Lauderdale and had lunch with her. And, um, uh, but I mean, I, I think you all can, you, you all get that, the, the, the desire to clock out. Now, why, why, why is that uh, something that we should all get a hold of and understand is because, and this is what we're going to get into this morning, where, wherever there are people, think about this, wherever there are people is an opportunity for the gospel. Doesn't matter where you're at. Think of your most busiest day of the week when you're running all those errands and you're going here and you're going there. Wherever there's people, there's an opportunity for the gospel. And I think, I think that's pretty amazing and incredible when you consider that. This morning we're going to look at Acts chapter 17. If you want to open up to that, uh, someone feel free to call out a verse. There's Bibles under your chair there. We're going to be looking, we're going to be focusing in on verses uh, 16 through 21. But uh, if, if you look at the beginning of Acts there, Paul and Silas arrive in Thess Thessalonica. 
And as was custom with Paul, this was, the, the synagogue seemed like it was Paul's honey hole. Whenever he wanted to go and witness, he would go to the synagogue, and that's what he did there, giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead and saying, this Jesus who I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. And if you look at the verses there, it said, some were persuaded and joined uh, Paul and Silas. But as you know, is also the custom with Paul. When he has some success, what happens? See there in the verses, it says, the Jews got jealous and formed a mob. And uh, uh, Acts chapter 17 is where, you know, this poor guy, Jason, He's, it seems like he's hosting Paul and Silas, and it's like the mob, they couldn't, find, uh, they couldn't find Paul and Silas, so they grabbed Jason. And this is where you get the, the verse where it said, these men who have come, who have upset the world, have come here also. And so it says immediately they take Paul and Silas by night, and they take them to Berea. And if you're following with me along in the verses there, what does it say? The people of Berea were much more noble. And they ate up everything that Paul and Silas told them. And it said, many believed, many followed him. But again, as is custom with Paul, um, the Jews from Thessalonica found out about Paul's success. They came uh, from Thessalonica down to Berea. And uh, I don't know what Paul did this time, but it says, immediately the brothers sent him by sea. So it's like, now, Paul, we can't, we're not even sure you should go by road. We're going to take you. We're going to get you in a boat. And um, said so the brothers sent him off to sea and brought him to Athens. Uh, that's about uh, a three, three days journey uh, by boat from Berea to Athens, about 12 days by land. And uh, that's where we find Paul waiting. And that's where we begin our, uh, our message this morning. So I guess I'll, I'll start off with a short prayer, if you want to bow your heads with me. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, uh, really help us uh, to, to come out of here this morning, Lord, realizing that uh, wherever there are people, uh, there's an opportunity for the gospel, and that, Lord, in many cases, eternity may hang in the balance uh, for the people that we meet. Amen. So uh, we find Paul waiting in Athens, and uh, uh, and the, I think the first thing the first thing that we have to know when it comes to preaching to strangers is we have to be available. In order to preach to strangers, we have to make ourselves available. Now you look at the beginning of verse sixteen. There it says, "Now Paul was waiting for them in Athens." It's the, the brothers conducted Paul to Athens, and uh, Paul apparently told them, go get me Paul and Silas, but it says Paul was waiting there. Now, the Bible doesn't say how long he was waiting there, but if you figure maybe the, the brothers that were conducting him to Athens, maybe they took a boat back, so it's a three days journey back, and then, you know, maybe they hung out for a couple days and then took the boat back. So I would say, again, the Bible doesn't say this. We're, we're probably thinking seven days at least in Athens, maybe more if um, they went by road. So what does Paul do while he's waiting? I'd ask you, you turn up in Athens, you've got seven days, what would, what would you do? What's that? Sightseeing, Sightseeing. <laughs> yes, the... The notion of, listen, this is Athens at the time. The notion of democracy had begun there. The city had been home to men such as Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. The Athens that Paul saw was a major center of learning, philosophy, literature, science, and art. Let's see here. And they had advances in theater, in music, in architecture, in laws, in politics. I mean, if I were Paul, man, what, what, what sights can you see there? The, is the Acropolis. I would go sightseeing. And uh, 
I think it's also important to remember what Paul had been through to this point. Remember in, uh, in Acts chapter 14 on his uh, ministry, first ministry journey when they stoned him? They stoned Paul and dragged him out to the outside of the city, thought he was dead, and it, apparently the brothers were just like, oh no, what happened? And Paul gets up, they go back into the city. Then on his second missionary journey in Acts chapter 16, it says he was dragged before the magistrate. They tore his robes off. They beat him with rods and then put him in prison. And then we get to Acts chapter 17. I'm just saying, if there was anybody that deserved a break, wasn't it Paul? Just to clock out, for, clock out from the Christian life for a, few, <laughs> a couple of days. Paul, matter of fact, the guys that conducted him to Athens, what do you think they told Paul? <laughs> Paul, brother, I know, you, I know you love Jesus. Can you just take a break? Go see some of the sights. See, apparently, and if you continue to read in, uh, in Acts chapter 17, um, the Lord did not care about Paul's particular circumstances. And it almost seems like right, right when we're ready to clock out of the Christian life and take a break, it's like that's when Jesus puts somebody in front of you to talk to. And a lot of times, if you look at your busy life, you, it, it could, it's likely somebody that you don't know. It's a stranger. I mean, I look at, and I'm going to ask this question a couple times this morning. Uh, is there anybody in the room that can trace your conversion, your coming to Jesus, or your awakening in the Christian life to a stranger meeting you? Because I know I can. I was already saved, but um, my awakening in the Christian life can be traced back to us. Actually, I met him. So I kind of, I was a fish that jumped in the boat. I was pretty easy. But, but I, I met him and it, you know, I, I thank, thank God, his, this guy's name is Akeen, that he did, decided not to clock out of the Christian life that day. Because I look, at my, I look at my life from then till now following Jesus and then I consider what it would have been like had I not followed Jesus over those many years. Um, but I think this has is, this is almost got to be our attitude when we're out and we're interacting with people is eternity hangs in the balance for some of the people that we're going to meet. And I think uh, what can we do? I think the first thing is uh, to recognize our reluctance to being available. Recognize it. Um, a lot of times... You could, you could say, well, um, uh, I, don't, I don't know what to say. Uh, if I meet somebody and I start talking to them, what am I going to say? What if they ask me about David Hume or what's another good philosopher? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody? What if, they, what if they ask me a question? I don't know. That could be your, that could be your reluctance. It could be, I know... Um, Sometimes you say, well, evangelism is just not my gift. Or um, uh, you could just, it could just be, hey, man, I'm tired. I got a lot going on in my life. I can't even, you know, I, I barely have time to talk to my wife, Jeff, and now you want me to go out and talk to strangers. Maybe it's um, just laziness. Whatever it is, I think that's the first thing you could do is just recognize, okay, I'm reluctant to do this. And then... Uh, if you really want to get practical, if you really want to get practical, I did this. You can go to the next slide. I just, I tracked a very busy Saturday uh, that I had uh, several weeks ago just to see um, all the opportunities that I had with people. And you look, I started at 7 in the morning. Of course, I started at 7 in the morning preparing for this message with John. So, uh, so that kind of set me up for the day. But I started at 7 in the morning, 
got gas for my car. I remember sitting there getting gas like, oh my gosh, there's, a st- there's someone getting gas right there. What do I say? What do I say? Um, and then uh, I went to get the oil changed. Of course, they came out and said, Jeff, we need, your, we need to change your brakes too. Okay, go ahead. I wasn't really a uh, um, Sam's Club car wash post office Went to a couple birthday parties. But this was a day where I, I, didn't, I was gone for 12 hours without coming back. Ran into all kinds of people. I think this is an interesting exercise to do is when you've got a busy day, look back on it and just consider all the opportunities that you had to, be, to outreach to strangers. So number one, we've got to be available. We've got to make ourselves available for God to use us as we're going through this uh, busy schedule. So if we continue on, and um, I'll just read some of these verses here. Uh, Acts chapter six, uh, 17, Now while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, it says his spirit was provoked within him as he saw the city was full of idols. And uh, this is the second thing that we need uh, to preach to strangers is our spirit must be provoked. Our spirit deep within us must be provoked by what we observe and what we see as we're, as we're going through there and we're uh, looking at people. So again, it says, his, Paul's spirit was provoked as he saw the city was full of idols. That word, that Greek word, uh, ketodolos, full of idols, It's the only place in the New Testament that that word is used, full of idols. Um, William Barclay writes in his commentary on, on Acts, he says, It is said that there were more statues of gods in Athens than all the rest of Greece put together, and that in Athens it was easier to meet a god than it was to meet a man. And some of the stuff I read while I was praying, some of the research or planning, uh, said that there was about 10,000 people in Acts when Paul visited. So you gotta, you got to realize this. Paul's in Athens. There's more than 10,000 statues, little idols. Verse 23 says, uh, For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So here's Paul. He's in Athens. He's decided that he's going to make himself available to God. And he's just walking around observing. For as I passed along and observed, you know, Paul had to eat while he was there, right? So he's passing along. What kind of, did they have gyros back then? I call them gyros, not gyros. He's just walking along observing. He stops to get something to eat. Joe, he's observing people. He, um, you know, he, he had just gotten his robe torn. Is it safe to say that maybe he stopped someplace to get his robe fixed? I don't know, the Bible doesn't say, but he's, he's passing along, he's doing this. And he's observing what he sees. And as he saw these idols, as he saw these idols, it says something deep within his spirit provoked him. In other words, he got agitated. He got concerned. He felt pity for the people that he saw. And he sees this temple. He says, he writes in here, he sees a temple, a big idol temple, and it says, to an unknown God, written down there. Now, I'd like to ask you guys another question. What would, what would we think of Paul if he had, he's walking along, he's observing, he sees the temple to an unknown God, and the Bible says, oh, he saw a temple to an unknown God and left. He, didn't, he wasn't concerned. His spirit wasn't provoked. Would, would our view of Paul change? Let me ask you. It probably would change. Here we are. Paul's thinking. 
here we are in the midst of this beautiful architecture where politics, politics was first invented. All these great philosophers came from here, this great center of learning. In that day, if you wanted to learn philosophy, you went to Athens. Paul's thinking, what a brilliant city. But in, at the same time, he's having this realization that in the midst of all this splendor and wealth, these people are going down to the gates of death. They're withholding their affections from the living God. This was his realization. This was his provoking. And this is what we have to have in order to witness to strangers. And I like to tell you, provoked, it's not just getting mad for the sake of getting mad. I don't know if you've ever been in a planning session you have a review of something you did. Everybody's real, e get, all the negative stuff comes real easy, right? It's real easy to get mad. It's always hard to find positive. So pr provoked is not just getting angry, for getting angry's sake. It's like the mind, the mind interprets the provocation deep within your spirit and realizes that there's a penalty. Almost realizes like, you know what? My time is short. My time is short. Their time is short. The age's time is short. If I don't say something, who else is going to say something? Eternity hangs in the balance here. And I, I went to, uh, when I first started to follow Jesus, I wasn't, uh, I was still kind of learning to follow him. Uh, I went to uh, the Far East to the far east back in 99 and the place i went to there were idols everywhere i mean you go into a store there'd be an idol you go into a hotel you the the cabs that you take there were idols everywhere and it just kind of gives you i think even back then you know I'm, I'm i'm not quite don't know the bible that well really learning to follow jesus i think even back then i'm realizing something is not right here this is not right. And I think our, our culture, of course, the U.S. has become pluralistic culture now, right? So there's all kinds of different religions here. And I remember I, a friend that I worked with um, was a Hindu, and I was with him in his car, and he had a little statue. I, th I don't know if it was Krishna, like right in kind of his dashboard. And... Uh, said, that's interesting. Why do you have that, uh, that statue there? And he, I think he pretty much told me it was for good luck or whatever. So you, you can run into idols, I think, here in the U.S. just because we're a pluralistic culture. But what I don't want us to do is think just because we don't see little statues of idols as we go about our day, day that the U.S. does not have a problem with idolatry. Don't think that we are exempt from idolatry here in the U.S. just because there's not little statues made by hands all over the place. An idol, an idol can be anything that replaces God. Anything that we put in place of God. What, what draws my heart? What if, 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 what if, is, if it's taken away from me, do I get real angry? That could be an idol. The, the, the interesting thing about idolatry here in the U.S. is many good things can turn into idolatry too. Many good things. But no matter what it is, idolatry ultimately destroys our relationship with God. So what idols are we likely to observe as you're going about your daily life? What, what are you likely to observe? I think to answer that question, um, I think it's good that we, we first have, have learned to deal with the idols in our heart, ourselves. Because how are we going to observe out there in the culture if we hadn't first dealt with things ourselves? But I know 
as far as observation, you remember, Paul, he's walking around, he's observing. He's walking around, he's observing. As you go through your daily life, you're observing. And I think uh, one, one form of idolatry that is very easy to observe, I think, is just the worship of the self. The worship of the people do all kinds of things to their bodies. They dress a certain way kind of way, whatever it is, I think this is, it's very easy to observe. Then there's things related to sexual ethics. There's drugs. There's alcohol, materialism, all kinds of idolatry for us to observe as we're walking around, around in our daily life. So what can we do? And again, I think the first thing is learn to pay attention to people. So don't walk with your head down like this all the time. Don't, does anyone have a, where's your iPad? Anyone got an iPad I can borrow? You know, don't walk looking at your, you know, they're saying more people are getting killed texting. And it's not those that are driving, it's those that are walking. <laughs> because they're looking down like this, they're getting hit by cars. So yeah, just don't, lift, lift your eyes up. Learn to observe people. Learn to, to see who's around you. And I, I think a good question to ask, ask ourselves is, do I have a concern for people? Do, do I have a concern for somebody outside of myself? And uh, if you're saying, Jeff, again, I barely have time to be concerned for my wife and my kids, I am with you. <laughs> I am with you. I'm probably one of the most self-focused people in this room. Ask Seth. Whenever I get around him, I just talk about my problems, and he's probably... <laughs> but, but in order for us to preach to strangers, we have to learn to get the focus off of ourselves and look around. Who's going out to lunch after the service today? Okay? <laughs> Nobody? You guys don't eat? <laughs> don't forget to look up. Look around. Have a concern for people. People watch. Does anyone in here ever people watch? <laughs> That's fun. I actually like it. We used to go to Cedar Point when I was younger, and we would just watch people, but that wasn't... That was more of an unholy people watching a non-Christian because we would talk about them as they passed. This is, a, this is a prayerful, prayerful people watch. You're, you're observing people. You're praying, Lord, I'm available. Is there anybody here that you need? So you're prayerfully um, watching people with concern, with pity. And again, if you really want to get practical, you don't have to do this, but this is something I did just to, just to kind of see what was my, my concern for people as I was going through this day. And again, you have to remember, I started out hanging out with John, reading the Bible at 7 o'clock in the morning, so my day was kind of set up for this. But um, so, of course, while I'm there with John, I'm looking around at Starbucks. Is there anybody I can talk to? I, I remember I told you I got gas for car, my, the car, and I was just, oh my gosh, there's someone over there. I, what do I say? Um, I got the, the Dennis Hyundai. They told me about the brakes. I wasn't, they kind of took me out of it a little bit there. Uh, car, uh, went to Sam's Club. I kind of got back into it. And I remember I got to the car wash, and I said, you know what? I'm, I'm going to have a conversation with, and so I was, I sat down, and again, there's, you can, based on the way you sit, you can tell people whether you want, whether you want it, so I remember I was just sitting there, just kind of like, look, looking, observing, I was probably observing too much, Joe, I was looking people right in the eye, they, they come, and uh, anyways, this lady, this lady walked by, and she said, do I know you from somewhere? Oh, hallelujah, someone to talk to. But it, it turns out she was um, Bella's preschool teacher. So that's how she knew me. Um, but yeah, track it. And it, the interesting thing about this whole day is when I was at Polaris, 
And I went to Carfagna's there. That's the grocery store. It's almost like I forgot I was a Christian. It was really strange. Like I, I'm, I'm walking through the mall and I got out later that day and I'm just thinking like, you know what? There was zero, cons- I mean, it wasn't even low. It was just, I was, it was almost like I think all the, the, the uh, you know, the things to buy kind of numbs, numbs your concern for people. That's one of the things I took away. So that's one way you can get really practical. So if we continue here, so you're available. You're making yourself available to God. You're observing people, allowing your spirit to be provoked. And the third thing that we need to do in order to preach to strangers, does anyone figure this out? I've, I, I've, I've left an important thing out. Anybody? No? You have to be willing to talk to people. <laughs> in order to preach to strangers requires the willingness to have a conversation. And if you look at, um, go back to Acts here, who did Paul run into? <clears throat> look at verse 17. It said, So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign deities because he's preaching Jesus and the resurrection. So Paul is walking around and observing. And it's interesting, if you read, if if you know Paul's story, he had a go-to. Whenever he wanted to witness and uh, preach the gospel. He had a go-to. And there's, there's a little, uh, there's another message in that point right there when it comes to gospel is you have a go-to. You have a place where, hey, you know, I'm going to go hang out. Paul's was the synagogue where he'd go and he'd talk to the religious people. He'd go and talk to the Jews. It says that he also met devout people. And these are people, they're not, not Jews. These are people that you'll run into they're not, they're not Christians. Um, they're not even postmodern. Um, they're not Jewish. But if you talk to them, they've got a fear for God. And they know that there's going to be a judgment. But they just hadn't quite figured out who, which way to go. Though Paul ran into some of those people. And then uh, it says he, he, there were people that Paul met by chance. People that he met by chance. Those who are, says, no, those who happen to be there. And these were the people that he met by chance. So even Paul, as he's walking, walking along observing, he met people by chance. Just as you will, as you go through your daily life, you will meet people by chance. If you go over here to um, Jason's Deli after, after uh, church today, you'll meet people by chance. Um, I know I've got to run some errands today. I'm going to meet some people by chance today. And then it also says that Paul met Epicurean philosophers and Stoic philosophers. Uh, Epicureans denied the existence of God and said that individual pleasure was the greatest good. The Stoics kind of believed in the existence of God, but they said everything was fixed by fate including God. So they were fatalistic. And of course, these are the people that were always, I think, a little bit nervous. What if I meet an Epicurean? What if I meet a Stoic? And they, they ask me something and I don't know how to respond. I'll get into that here in a little bit. Um, but Paul, it says in, in here, in, if you read the book of Acts, Paul is always reasoning. He's always reasoning with people. And the way I look at reasoning is it's, uh, I mean, it, it could be an argument. It could be that you're arguing w- with someone. But the way I look at reasoning, it's a two-way conversation. It's not one person saying, Ray, how come you haven't believed in Jesus? It's, Ray, what do you believe about God? Yeah, Ray says something back to me. And there's a, there's a reasoning There's a reasoning going on. 
So again, I ask, ask you again, can anybody trace their conversion to Jesus to meeting a stranger? Anybody? You, yeah? I, uh, I can definitely trace mine. And, um, and I'm, like I said, his name was Akeen. He, he invited me to church and then cooked me this awesome African food until I really started to love the Lord. I used to go over his house every Wednesday. He'd cook this real spicy African food. He'd always say, oh, I, I didn't make it spicy. It's not spicy. And we'd all, there was this one, one guy in our group who had a bald head and his head would just sweat. I said, Akeen, you said you didn't make this spicy. But he, he kept feeding me African food until I really started to love Jesus. But, um, <laughs> but there, there we are in Barnes & Noble, Kenny and Henderson Road. It's no longer there. It's a bar now. And I mean, that, that was my go-to because I was in multi-level marketing and I had to go out and meet people. And uh, so I, I, like I said, I, I'm a fish that jumped into the boat and you will find these people. If you make, I want to tell you this right now, if, if you make yourself available to God, you will have experiences where the fish just jump into the boat. And you're just like, oh, I, oh my gosh, I didn't do anything. And um, I remember, you want to know what Akeen's deep message to me was? His very deep message Jeff, I'm very excited and passionate about my church. Do you want to come? No, no philosophical quotes. No argue, no argue. Jeff, I'm really excited about my church. Do you want to come? Said, again, I was easy. Sure. You just have to call me up Sunday morning because that's when I sleep in. That's when I catch up on my sleep from my busy week. And of course, Akeen called me up for about three months uh, every Sunday morning until I realized I'm 27 years old. I should know how to use an alarm clock by now. I, should, I, should, I don't need someone to call me up. So then I started to follow. follow uh, and that's, that's why I'm here today. Can you believe that? If, if I'd introduce you to some of my friends pre-Jesus, you could talk to him and say, I can't believe Jeff Fries is up there speaking Sunday morning. But this is from this meeting with the Keen. And um, one of the things I did, uh, I did this week is uh, to put the finishing touches on my message. I went to uh, a particular coffee shop. I will not name it, but it's my favorite coffee shop in Grandview. And um, they, uh, they've got actually this new table there where if you sit there, you are forced to sit next to somebody. So I sat there every night and um, Thursday night, and I was tired, working all day, come home and eat, rest for a minute, go to Stoff's, and um, <laughs> darn it! That's my... That's... So I'm sitting there, and I remember I did this big yawn. I was like, and then this guy just like sits down like right there. I, I opened my eyes. I'm like, oh. And he, he looked at, I had my Bible open. And he said, man, that's a big book. Again, I'm telling you, they will jump in the boat. Of course, I had the Bible open. I said, yeah, I'm giving the message at church on Sunday. And I said, we got to talk and I asked him what he did. He said he was in software development. So then my executive recruiter side, really? What do you, what do you, here's, here's my business card. What do you, and I, I was telling Josh before we started this morning, I, I said like, here I am preparing for a message on this and I almost forgot that here's a strange, Jeff, there's a stranger here, brother, come on. And so we get to talking and I said, hey, do you have a church? No, and um, I said, well, what do you believe about God? And it's interesting. He was one of the devout people. He said, you know what? I believe in God, and I believe there's going to be a judgment. But I'm not, I'm not, I haven't picked any particular religion. He said, my dad was a Muslim, and my mom was a Jew, so I probably, um, I probably more Muslim. 
And so I had a conversation with him based on a little bit of what I knew about uh, um, that, that particular religion. And, uh, you know, we get done and I say, uh, so are you going to come to church on Sunday? He said, no, but I think I'm, think I'm going to read a little bit more. And I said, oh, you're going to read a little bit more because of me? And, I, and um, I said, well, you know what? How about we meet here at Stoffs? I said it again. How about we meet here and read the Bible together? And, um, and I, got, I, I got my favorite, my favorite words. I, I, I love these words. He said, I'll, I might meet you to read the Bible, but you're not going to convert me. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. The Holy Spirit's going to convert I'm just, I'm just a man. <laughs> so, uh, so, so first thing, who do you talk to? Kind of wrapping things up here. Who do you talk to? I always say, talk to somebody that's like you. Talk to somebody like you. When, when I used to train people at Oasis to do this, I would say, okay, guys, don't talk to girls. Girls, don't talk to guys. But try, find someone that looks like you. Look yourself in the mirror. That's who you should find somebody like that to talk to. And then, the, you know, the next big question is, well, what if, what if they ask me something that I don't know? Because we all believe that we're going to meet the Stoic. We're going to meet the Epicurean. And I would say if you do step one, if you're talking to people that look like you, you're, you're, you're going to run into people that got the same problems you got that are stressed out about life with the same things you're stressed out about. And they're not going to, the first thing they're going to, they're not going to bring up to you um, some great philosophical questions. They're probably going to say, you know, I'm busy. I'm busy beyond, if I met somebody like myself. Um, okay, then the next big question is, how do I start a conversation? And I'm going to go back to the, this, I know it's Sunday, but throwback Thursday. How do you start a conversation? I want you to remember this acronym. SALT. SALT. What does, what does SALT mean? Okay, the S is very easy. And as you're, you're, you're walking about, you're, you're going about your daily business, you have to look for clues to start conversations with people. So the S is say something. And then as you say something, A, ask a question. And I'd say there's, there's three things, um, and there's going to be a test after this, so everybody make sure you pay attention, because if I find you're not paying attention, I'm going to call on you, and you're going to come up here. So there's three things that you could ask a question about. Um, you can observe the person. What is Oasis? You can observe the environment. My goodness, have you ever been in the post office on a Saturday? What is that environment? My goodness, the line. Oh, my hair's going to, I'm going to need a haircut before I get out of here. You're waiting in line. You observe the environment. I think the news is another great one. Just being up to date. I mean, here in Columbus, when is the first Buckeye game? The, the, the seventh. You can ask anybody in Columbus, what do you think about the Buckeyes? And you're going to be able to start a conversation. Then L in salt is listen. Listen. Ask a question and then listen. This guy I met uh, the other night, it was a lot of, hmm, interesting. Wow, I could see how you would think that. Oh, ask another question. Then the other big one is a T, turn the conversation. And... Um, this is uh, where I think I, I'd, I'd use um, a, a, a five or ten second faith flag. This is always a difficult one. Like, what do I say? The guy I met at the coffee shop was easy. Do you go to church? I was at uh, um, getting my eyes checked a while ago. And, you know, they put those drops in where you, you can't see. And um, I was sitting there thinking, like, Man, this seems like a lot worse than the last time because I really couldn't see anything and I'm starting to have a conversation with somebody and um, he was a chef at one of the local restaurants and I was trying to figure out now, how do I turn the conversation? What do I say? And um, I was thinking, well, I, what I was going to ask him is, uh, you know, we're having a big, uh, my church 
is having a big uh, picnic on September 13th. Does your restaurant do catering? I was, I was, that's, get the word, that's a faith flag. That's where you tell people, I go to church and see what they respond back. Uh, I didn't get to ask them uh, because the doctor came out, right, at that time. So let's do, um, Corey, why don't you come up here? Okay. Let's do this here. Okay. This is, this is where I used to work, by the way. I don't learn. Okay. What's going on? Yeah. You know, where do you, how do you know my name? Oh. I'm a stranger. Hey, what's up? What's up? Care work, tech worker. Okay, let me ask you guys. Help, help Corey. What is, what is a question he could ask me? What is care works? Do you care for people? Do you care work? What, what is, what do you what guys is, do? yeah, what do you guys do? How about, um, how about, um, do you work? Is that, is that where you work? Care works? Then what would be a good follow-up question? I say yes. What would be a good follow-up question? What kind of stuff do you do? What kind of stuff do you do? Well, I just, I just moved in from out of town and, um, I'm a, I'm a recruiter. Information technology people. Oh, okay. I knew a guy like that one. Yeah. <laughs> he went to church. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Give it up, brother. See, that's how you do it. Okay. Okay, Brendan, come here. Come here. I couldn't find my OSU hat, so my summer hat. We're, maybe we're at McDonald's okay. or something. I'm getting my coffee. You cold? <laughs> it is. Uh, I know it is summertime. It is summertime. Uh, how, how about those Buckeyes, man? Yeah. Yeah, it was fantastic this year. Yeah, what do you think they're going to do? Uh, well, the season's almost over because they're doing well. Yeah? It's cold out now. Yeah. But they're doing good. Um, Who's going to be a quarterback? Who do you think is going to be the quarterback? Who do you, who do you appreciate? Um, I, I like 12 Gauge. You like What's 12 his name? Gauge. Uh, Cardell, Jones. Cardell Jones. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like all my quarterbacks to be 6'5, 270. They knock weak linebackers over. You know what's weird? Yeah. I have a guy that I go to church with. Yeah. Grandview Christian Center. His name is Jeff. Yeah. He also loves 12 Gauge. Yeah, okay. You come talk to him one day. What's the name of your church? Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, I want someone to look at. Uh, okay. What What could you say to this man right here, if you saw him? What question could you ask him? Yeah. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> How do you feel about? Uh, okay. Just one. An, another quick one. Because a lot of times you're going to end up in a. Uh, you're going to end up in a dentist office getting your oil changed in your car. Someone's going to be reading a book. What would you say to this one? Do you have... Uh, how, you know, sometimes you need a... Do you like to read? Or, or no, that's a dumb question. <laughs> but remember, there's never a dumb question, all right? But you could say, uh, wow, that looks like an interesting book. And then what could you say next? Do you have boys? Now, Corey, I just, one more for Corey. Or Greg, here, this one's for you, okay? Okay, you see somebody reading this book. Why I am not a Christian. Oh, so. So you like the book? <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, I like it. Oh, yeah, it's a good philosopher. Do you agree with everything? 
Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I got a lot of questions. Yeah, like what? Like, um, if there's God, why is there so much bad stuff in the world? Yeah. Have you read any Plantinga? Who? Plantinga. He's a philosopher as well. Mm-mm. Okay. No, I've never read that. Sure. Yes, I do. <laughs> when can we meet? I don't know, Monday night. Do you know where Stoffs is at? <laughs> oh, that's kind of... Okay, so you get the picture. So, um, and if, if you've got kids, um, you have a built-in conversation starter, by the way. Especially, uh, when, I mean, especially when they start to walk, but a built-in conversation starter. So why are we doing this? Because whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But how are they going to call on him in whom they have not believed? In other words, in order to call, the person has to believe. And how are they to believe in him in whom they've not heard? In order to believe, they have to hear something these people that we meet. And how are they to hear without someone preaching? In order to hear, somebody has to speak to them. And how are they to preach unless they are sent? So I think leaving today, you, we're all going to scatter when we leave here, whether you're going out to eat or whether you're going home or whether you're running an errand. I'd like to ask you are, you, are you going out to eat or are you being sent by God to go out to eat? I know a lot of the vacations are done for the summer. Mine's over. But when you go on a vacation, are you being sent on vacation? Or are you just going on vacation? Of course, it says, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. Would you like to have beautiful feet? You know, I think, I think the Lord gets excited about this. Whenever, you know, here you are, you're at Jason's Deli or wherever you're at, and you're just having a little conversation with someone, I think the Lord gets excited. Wow, those are beautiful feet. Why? Because they're bringing good news. So that is my message. I'll say a quick prayer to end. Lord Jesus... Uh, we ask for beautiful feet. Lord, um, send us out as we leave today. Lord, uh, let us be your servants who are sent out into the world. And uh, Lord, have, have mercy on us. Give us that, that boldness or that little nudge that we need to have a conversation with a stranger.